in, in here. And uh, I personally hope that the Israeli situation can be better soon. Okay, so the title of this talk is on colorings of hypographs embeddable in RD, and uh, this is a joint work with Aaron Nevo in Hebrew University. Okay, so there are many things, but uh, basically this is the coloring problem about the hypographs, and the uh, uh, hypographs which has the condition about the embeddability in RD. So there are three things that we need to think about for this kind of, uh, so for this specific problem. The first thing is the dimension. Okay, so can you see the cursor? Where is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. So, so the first thing is the dimension that you need to, uh, you need to see. So the dimension D in of RD that we are embedding the hypographs into. Another thing is the size of the hyperedges for hypographs. We will basically think about only uniform hypographs. And uh, yeah, we will denote the, um, uh, the size of hyperedges by K. Okay, so the, we will only think about the K uniform hypographs. Another thing that we need to think about is uh, the, the notion of embeddability. And uh, there are two notions of embeddability that we will think about. The first thing is a PL embeddability. And second thing is the geometric embeddability. And we will think about the three categories uh, depending on the, those the three parameters. And uh, as you can see in here, actually these uh, three cases are not, very, uh, not exist exhaustive, actually. And so the thing, the case, the, the larger case that we could not cover is the full dimensional case for geometric embeddability when the dimension is even. We will talk about it later. And after that, we will also think about the uh, coloring uh, S-dimensional phases of a uh, triangle-level D-manifold. And uh, we will have a brief discussion after that. OK. So the, let us start the introduction. OK, so this is the main question that we are interested in. So this is the question. So this question was originally, uh, this question was originally asked by Haize, Panajito, Pikruko, and Taras in, in their 2014 paper. And it asked the following. What is the maximum weak chromatic number that a K-uniform hypograph with which is uh, geometrically or PL embeddable into RD have. Okay, so <coughs> okay, so but uh, there are many notions that we that that is not very clear now. So we will first define the geometric embedding. So geometric embedding of a k-uniform hypograph H is uh, <laughs> is uh, a <coughs> yeah. So I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm pressing the wrong button up over and over again. So K uniform hypograph H into RD is a function from the vertex set into RD such that uh, which has the following two conditions. The first condition is that the dimension of the affine hull of every hyper edge, the image of every hyper edge should be K minus one for the, yeah, so it's a big, yeah. And uh, it just says that, um, so every hyper edge should be sent into the full dimension as uh, the large dimension, the largest dimension that it can have. So in other <coughs> words, the phi, the, the embedding phi should not be degenerate. So that is the thing that the first, uh, first condition <coughs> says. And the second condition says is that the intersection of the convex hull of the two hyper edges should occur only only where it is it is supposed to be. So yeah, it should the, the intersection of the two hyper edges in the embedding in the RD should not should not occur outside of this intersection. Yes. So so maybe it might be better to see a picture. So this is the typical 
way of seeing uh, the geometric embedding of a hypergraph, you can see the hyper hy three uniform hypergraph with the three hyper edges with how many vertices? One, two, three, six vertices in there. And yeah, and uh, as you can see, every hyper edges are just the triangles in there. So, so every hyper, every hyper, it is a two-dimensional, and uh, it is a three uniform. So it satisfies the first condition, and also, yeah. So the intersection is not uh, it occurring. Uh, so intersection only occurs where it's supposed to be. For example, like intersection. Can you show the condition again. Okay. Yeah. Just remind. Yeah. Convex. Yeah. For example, it says that the intersection should not appear something like this. This is the bad intersection. Bad. So this is a one hyper edge, okay. and uh, this is uh, another hyper edge, and the intersection occurs in here. And uh, this intersection cannot appear in here because uh, this, this uh, convex all is basically the same. So I mean, the, so the, what is the intersection of the vertex set in here? It is empty set, right? So vertex intersection is empty set, and what is the convex hull of the empty set? It should be empty set, right? But we do not, yeah, we, yeah, this intersection is not appearing here, okay? So this is what this condition is saying. So this, uh, this intersection should not happen, okay? But could, could they intersect in that segment or just the two points? Ah, yes. So yeah. intersection is occurring in these segments and also including these two points. But, but so the, these two points is not vertex of the, this hyper edge. So, so a phi of, is phi of E a, yeah. uh -huh. just the three segments or is the full triangle? Yeah, so these are the three. Uh, so, so, uh, okay. so this, we are thinking about the two triangles, E1 and E2. Uh -huh. And E1 has a vertex of V1, V2, V3. Yeah. And E2 has a vertex at W2, W1, W2, and W3. Yeah. So actually, these uh, two two points are not vertices of either of e neither of e1 nor e2 e1 or nor e2. Okay. Yeah, but the condition is convex hull. You look at the convex hull and then yeah. the intersection. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the yeah. Just going to this uh, thing. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so this uh, geometry method <laughs> is nothing but just uh, putting the, all the triangles or the any kind of the K minus one dimensional simplices for each uh, hyper edge such that uh, it should not have, uh, it should not have a non-trivial uh, intersection between them. So that is what, they, uh, what it says. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the uh, definition of geometric embedding. So is it clear? The definition clear? So when these two, then is it same as the plane graph without loops? Or um, or is it more like geometric graph? Is it a straight yeah, line? Yeah, it's ge geometric graphs with the straight lines. For, yeah, for <laughs> graph, yes. yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, okay, so this is the geometric imbe embeddability. And uh, yeah, but before <coughs> introducing the PL embeddability, so just to think about think about this. So so somehow we just think about so we are just thinking about the hypergraph as a kind of the geometric object. Without thinking about the Euclidean space RD, we somehow identify every hyper edge with a k minus one dimensional simplex simplexes. And uh, we somehow understand it as a geometric object as uh, with a very nice identi identification with each other without considering drawing or the without uh, thinking about the embedding in RD, we can, we can still think about it as a geometric objects like this. But somehow, yeah, <coughs> so this is, a ba so this is uh, how we understand the, yeah, understand the hypograph. But somehow, we don't like it. We don't like this hypograph. We'd like to have uh, more and more edges for each of the, sim each of the hyper edge in here. So we divide it divide each simplex into the many, many, many simplices inside in there. And this is called the subdivision of a hypergraph. Yeah. So yeah, when it, yeah. <coughs> so every hyper edge as, a, as understood as a simplex, we uh, divide it into the many, so if, if uh, we divide into the many, many simplices, and uh, if we regard each of the simplex in here uh, as a hyper edges of the new 
hypergraph, then the, this is a subdivision of the original hypergraph. Okay. So is this definition clear about the subdivision? And the, when we have this definition, then the, we define the PL embeddability as follows. H is a PL embeddable into RD if H has a subdivision H prime, which is geometrically embeddable into RD. So the, these are the two definitions that we have. And uh, this is the, yeah, there will not be any fancy <laughs> definitions after this. Yeah, I hope that this definition is clear. So subdivision is really like dividing up edge yeah. into separate edges? Yeah, yeah, so for graphs, so it is a subdivision of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, subdivision of the many edges and, uh, yeah, and so on. Yeah, so basically it's uh, something like this. So can you resolve them as, like, in geometry, geometry embedding, we are yeah. embed like plane or some affine hull, and mm -hmm. in PL embeddable, we mm -hmm. can somewhat bend it. Yeah, so something bend. like this. Yeah, so somehow, for example, we have we have a simplex like this, and then the, the one of the famous subdivision is a barycentric subdivision by introducing the barycenters of the each face, and then adding all of this. So this is a barycentrically subdivided into the six faces in there, and the, by what what we mean by geometrically. Uh, so this is a PL embeddable. This uh, simplex is a PL embeddable into RD. So this is now geometrically embeddable in here. And uh, this is now, so now we need to see the three-dimensional picture. But uh, yeah, somehow it should like this, but uh, there should be another basis. It was like, the, it is a somehow bent into R3. So I mean, the, this point is going down, and the, the, it bends all the faces to the below. And the, the, the resulting picture is something like this. Yeah, I think I need to draw the better <laughs> picture about the, yeah. So it is basically like a hexagon. It's a coning over hexagon. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it can be embedded something like this. Okay. Uh, any other questions? How is there any easy example that yeah. not geometry embeddable but PL embeddable? Uh, yes, uh, there should yeah there should be many examples. Yeah, so maybe we can think about it later. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I think there. So I I cannot come up with the easy. There should be, yeah yes yeah there should be easy example, but the, I cannot come up with it easily. Okay, so <coughs> yeah. K equals 2 is the same. K equals 2, it is the same, and uh, yeah. Right? Yes. Uh -huh. Because embed. Yeah, yeah. Play embed. Okay, so this, so anyway, we are thinking about the, this question, and another definition is um, chromatic number. So we need to also think about the, what kind of coloring notion that we are thinking about. There are many, many notions in for hypergrass, but uh, we are thinking of the weak coloring of H, where the, all the hyper edges should be not monochromatic. It should, all the hyper edges should obtain at least the two colors. And so this is the weak coloring, and the, we are thinking of the weak chromatic number uh, using the weak, uh, weak coloring. So since we are only using the, this col coloring, we will just say that the, we will just say coloring and the chromatic number. Okay, so the, this is the, all the definitions. And uh, what they obtain is uh, somehow like this. So this is uh, so this uh, summarizes the result by Heisen, Ah, Panajito, and Picruco and Taras. But before that, let us think about this. Yes, when D is equal to two and K is equal to two, so this is uh, just uh, nothing but just a planar graph case. And uh, we all know that this by the four color theorem, it should be, yeah, the chromatic number should be bounded by four. And another example is that, um, yes, when D, equal, D is equal to 2 and K is equal to 3. So this is, a, if I can call it, it is like a planar 3 uniform hypergraph case. It is like a triangulation of the sphere, or the, maybe the part of the triangulation of the sphere. Okay? And uh, in this case, 
By using also the four color theorem, we can obtain the chromatic number bounded by two. So can you, can you guess how we can get this bound? So this can be obtained by this. Yeah, obtained from this. Yeah. Shadow and yeah. Four, by four color theorem, we can color by four color and merge two colors. Yes, exactly. Mer merge two colors by two and uh, yeah. Yes. So if there are two colors, <laughs> if there are four colors, color classes like this, we merge these two colors and these two color classes as a new color class W1 and W2, and this will give a, yeah, we coloring for the yeah, three uniform hyperbrain. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so anyway, so the dimensional two case is a very, uh, very good. And uh, we had uh, all the finite bound and uh, it is, uh, yeah, so the world looks very beautiful. But the, after this, the world does not look very beautiful because um, it, we do not have uh, finite bounds. So, so as you can see in here, we see this boundary and also this boundary. So this, so I'll just call it black boundary. So this black boundary is obtained. Yeah. So if you see the black boundary, you can see that the bound. So the all the, all the, how can I say? So the the D and K is uh, so the K is almost a half a dimension D, right? So the slope is something like going like this, right? So this is because that the somehow for embeddability. <coughs> Concerning, uh, so considering the even dimensional spaces, even dimensional simplicial complex, as I, sorry, so half dimensional simplicial complexes are very important. So it was uh, quite frequently, no, it's uh, frequently used in the area of topology. So this is, uh, this is uh, like a classical bound. And uh, what they did for, the, for their lower bound construction is that they somehow push it a little bit uh, to obtain the better bound in here for these cases. Okay, so this is what they did. Also, I need to mention that they did not only count, uh, so only say that uh, they have the construction of the unbounded chromatic number, they computed the exact chromatic number in terms of the number of vertices, yeah, n to d something like that. So they, they not only yeah, constructed those examples, but they also computed the exact function as a, uh, as a function of it. So that is what they did. What yeah. is the difference of red and black? Red and black is the red, uh, so black was known and the red was new. Yeah. Yeah, so red was their result. Okay, so that, that was their result. And after that, uh, I was interested in this, but the, I was, uh, um, I was more interested about the transversal ratio which is a ratio between the transversal number and the vertex set, the size of the vertex set. So transversal number is the, yeah, so what is the transversal? So transversal, so is a set there exists some vertex T such that the T is in H. So in other words, so this, this uh, vertex appears every hyper edge in the yeah, in this hypergraph, and the the transversal number of hyper hypergraph edge is the minimum size of the uh, transversal of H. So this is the definition, and uh, we are think so we want to think about the. Uh, the, this ratio between the, the size of the vertex set and the transversal number. number. So this is uh, basically what, what we wanted to do. And uh, to compute that, so, but, so actually we somehow, so with, uh, yeah, with uh, Joseph Briggs and the Michael Dobbins over there, mm -hmm. and uh, me, so we somehow constructed a neighborly PL3 sphere minus one facet, facet with uh, 21 vertices and the uh, transversal number exactly, uh, not exactly 11, but it should be at least 11. At least 11, so it should have a transversal number at least uh, uh, tw uh, 21 over 11. And uh, by using that, uh, by using that, uh, we can have, um, yeah, so this construction should have a chromatic number at least three, okay? Okay, so this was the previous result. 
I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. So you, these numbers, yeah. uh, does that mean numbers are bounds, but Yes, numbers are bounds. <coughs> lower bounds? bounds. Or ah, lower bounds, sorry. Lower yeah. bounds? Yeah, all the things, yes, I should specify that all the things in here are lower bounds for the, yeah, for the chromatic number, for each of the cases. By lower bound, you mean, the, uh, like, I mean, there are isographs with yeah. chromatic number will be smaller than that, right? Ah, right? yeah, so yes. Yes, 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 I need yeah. lower bound of the upper bound. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry. So I, I yeah, needed yeah. to st state, the, state the question more clearly, but the, we are thinking about the, this question. Ah, we are thinking about the maximum okay, right. chromatic number. Yeah, and uh, we think about the lower bound for the maximum chromatic number that we can have mm -hmm. for the each of the cases <laughs> K for K and D. Okay, so <laughs> <All> right, <laughs> sorry, sorry for confusing. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so they, so after this, uh, we have we could obtain the lower bound, uh, small lower bound construction for only for this case, and we were very happy, but uh, we could not obtain uh, for more. But the yeah, so the, our results, uh, so my results with the Neville is that actually we have yeah, and also I need to specify specify that uh, this is for PL case, and not the geometric case. Okay. And but the after after this, so what we uh, what I obtained with Aaron Neville is that the, this. So <laughs> we somehow yeah we somehow uh, made uh, all the lower bound constructions for the PL for the PL embeddability, and the, this is the statement. So for yes, yeah, so these uh, two cases are basically think about the three dimensional cases. Yeah, so at least the three dimensional cases, and the for this. Uh, uh, D plus one uniform hypogress PL embeddable into RD has an unbounded chromatic number. That is, the, the, there is a construction which has an unbounded chromatic number. And also for each of the cases, but uh, with not full dimensional cases, yeah, so note that this, the, to have a full dimension, uh, K should be equal to D plus one, but so it is not full dimensional case. So in these cases, K uniform hypogress could be also geometrically embeddable into RD, and that there are certain constructions like that. And uh, yeah, so that is the yeah. So by these uh, two results, we could have uh, this condition, and uh, so we could have uh, this uh, table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what about the geometric embeddability for the top? So is there any question about this result? Statement of this result? Okay, if not, then the, yeah, so th th this is the last result. Somehow, somehow we could not get, uh, yeah, for geometric immutability in the full dimensional cases, we could not <coughs> get a really nice uh, unbounded chromatic number construction, but we still could get some construction for the old dimensional, old dimensional cases. And uh, we could not get uh, anything in the even dimensional cases. Yes, so, but the for all dimension, we could construct it that uh, the chromatic number is exactly three. Mm -hmm. Or so it requires at least three. So this is the, the statement of main theory. I hope that uh, every statement and definitions are clear. Okay. Is there some kind of construction where you can mm -hmm. like add on add a vertex and yes. extend every edge by adding this, uh, this vertex into every edge and make up, um, like a start with the k-uniform high school. Yes, actually we will do something like that at, at the almost the final, yeah, <laughs> or the almost the final page. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Yeah, that is, yeah. So actually we will extend a similar idea to extend it to the any kind of triangle level manifold. Yes, we will describe briefly later, but the idea is not uh, very simple. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, it is not exactly our result. Okay, so so if there is no question, then the, we will first uh, think about the full dimensional case. Uh, so, yeah, full dimensional case for PL embeddability. So now, so D is greater than or equal to three. K is equal to D plus one, and we are thinking about PL dimensional case. Okay. Okay, so how can we do? So the main idea, so the, the idea and proof is uh, very simple. So the idea is that PL embed the hypograph of combinatorial lines of the T to the N. 
So which I like to call the hale sujuet hypergraph into RD. So let us recall the hale sujuet theorem. So yeah. So the, this is the definition of the combinatorial line. So combinatorial line is defined to be that the, for the moving coordinates, so this should be moving coordinates, yes. For the moving coordinates and the, the other fixed coordinates, uh, yeah. So the combinatorial line is defined like this. And for, uh, yeah, for a cube, and um, <coughs> we collect all the cube from the, yeah, from, from the hypercube like this. Then, the, so we, we like to call this as a Hellsdruet hypergraph. And the, yeah, so this is the reformulation, uh, not reformulation, but the restatement of the Hellsdruet theorem for our purpose. For every e positive integer t and m, there exists the n such that the Hellsdruet hypergraph of on the, this hypercube is not intolerable. Okay, so we already, we already have the hypergraph already. So the <coughs> basic point is the how to embed this Hale's Jewett hypergraph. But this hypergraph is n uniform. Right? Yes. Ah, so this uh, hypergraph is t uniform. T uniform. Uh, t uniform. Yes. Uh, so I need to think of it. So basically, what we think about is that um, yeah. So the moving coordinate is uh, coming, yeah, so it, it is moving from the 1 to t, actually. Yeah, so it, it is uh, moving from 1 to t, so the, the Hell's-Jewett hypergraph should have a, sh should be t uniform. Okay, so this, mm -hmm. yeah, so we have the Hell's-Jewett uh, theorem and uh, all the things, so we have a very nice hypergraph. So now it is, it is enough to embed Hell's-Jewett hypergraph, but the, Actually, I was not really thinking about that, that this might happen because when we think about Hell's Jewett hypergraph, it should it is uh, something like n-dimensional object, not the t t t minus one dimensional object, right? But the, actually, we can do that because it is linear. So this is a linear hypergraph. So which means that any pair of hyper edges has an intersection of size at most one. And because it has a size, so it has a size at most one. What we like to do, is gamma on the vertex at v, h is called the L interlacing with respect to this order. If there there are distinct hyper edges e1 and e2, and the vertices v1 to vl, such that the v1 vi is in e1 when i is in O and the vi is in E2 when i is even. So, so the definition is written very complicatedly, but it basically says like this. So we want to v2 l minus 1 vl, v3. So it is, so the containment alternating happens something like this. So for example, if it is E1 again, then it should be E2, something like this. But uh, note that, E1 and E2 can intersect each other. It does not need to be disjoint. Okay, so, so this is the definition. And uh, this is a crucial lemma that, that we have. So what is the condition, uh, what, uh, what is the condition, what is the criterion for the embeddability on the moment curve? H is embeddable on the moment curve by a specific order. I mean, the, we just put every vertex of the hypergraph by this uh, certain order, and uh, this becomes embed embedding in that dimension if and only if H is not d plus 2 interlacing. So interlacing with respect to, so this is a combinatorial criterion for the embedding. And the proof sketch is the following. So, so basically, so eventually it will be reduced to the case when the E1 and E2, so for the, for the two hyper H case, where the union of two hyperedges are d plus two, and uh, they are disjoint. Somehow, somehow, more or less, it, it is reduced like that. Then after that, we somehow use the Radon's lemma and the list of faces of the convex hull of d plus two points on gamma d. So, yeah. So, so Radon's lemma tells that uh, when uh, so, whenever you have a d plus two points. Those two d plus two points can be partitioned into two parts such that the convex hull intersect with each other. And uh, if you see the list of faces, except for this interlacing case, like uh, 
Yeah, so the, except for this interlacing case, the other cases cannot intersect with each other because one of the one of the parts should be a face of uh, this <coughs> convex hole. So that is the yeah, key idea of uh, how this the proof works. Okay, so now we have this lemma, and uh, the the hypergraph construction that we consider is the following hypergraph. And uh, I think this hyper this construction is also looks like also the very famous for the from the literature, and uh, we so yeah so so let us uh, define the hypergraph. So the K uniform hyper so the, this is the <coughs> hypergraph that we like to embed in R D. So the K uniform hypergraph H K M was uh, constructed. And this was uh, constructed by Eckerman, Kazek, and uh, Paul Volki. And uh, actually, this was uh, originally, so the similar construction was also covered by Park and Tardos and Toth. And yeah, so this is a kind of the recursive construction. So let us, uh, yeah, so in here, K is uniformity, which means that uh, it is the size of the each hyper edge, and M is the step of recursion. And uh, yes, M starts with two, so it, it starts with the step two, not one. Okay, so, so this is for just a convenient for notation. Okay, so let us first see that the, how the first step, HK2, is constructed. So we, I will just give the example of the K equals three. So the hyper edges are coming from this tree of the depth two and the width three. And the uh, hyper edges are uh, formed by, so hyper edges are either the ch children of uh, any internal vertex, so these uh, four hyper edges, or the maximum chains in here, like this. And uh, this is not too colorable. <coughs> Can you see why? Why it is not too colorable? Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Body. Yeah. Suppose that it is a two color. Let's just, let's color everything with the two colors in here. Then the every children should use all two colors, right? Mm. Yes, you, you see why. <laughs> you see why. Then, so starting from the, the first vertex, well, so blue. So let's let us say that the, it is all we use the red and blue colors, and the first the vertex we use a red color, for example. The, oh no. <laughs> Yeah, so, the, uh, so let us assume that the first, uh, first uh, vertex is colored by red. And then, so for this uh, stage, we can also choose the, yeah, so since all the colors are used, so we can choose the vertex which is colored by red, and so on and so on. And eventually, you'll find the maximal chain which is all colored by red. And this is the contradiction that it was uh, too colorful, right? So this is not too colorful. And actually, this is uh, not mine. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, but their result. <laughs> yeah, so, but they, they somehow constructed, yeah. And also, I think that this construction was already considered by Park, Tarados, and Toth. But F, so what they did is that actually they somehow uh, built a recursive construction uh, on this. And that they show that uh, H, so this recursive construction is not M colorful. So I'll just explain the how the recursive construction is going. So again, we are also using the, the tree, which has like this. So for the k equals three case, it has also that two. Okay. And uh, we also collect all the all the chains, maximal chains uh, from there. And uh, for the for the children of the all the internal vertices, we make the copy of a, the previous step. We copy the, the hypergraph of the previous step, H K minus one there. And they somehow, yeah, and uh, it has the, yeah, it, it, 
and uh, it has a we can also build a very nice uh, tree structure like this so we make the, all the chains as a hyper edges and also the all the hyper edges from the each of the hapis as a hyper edges also this is the definition of the hkm and uh, so what they show again is that hkm is not incolorable and but the, we should also think about the order, right? So how do you define the order? So define the order, we define the order by depth first search, right? So we, the, the, in the, from the first step, we have a order of the, uh, order of the previous step. And after that, we also use the depth first search in such a way that it should be consistent with uh, all the hyper edges from the previous step, right? So this is the construction. So okay. By yeah. DFS, you mean the DFS in the underlying tree? Yes, underlying on the underlying tree. So, <coughs> so the order is also defined very recursively. For example, for HK two, we use the DFS in on this in this mm -hmm. tree, and after this, all these uh, vertices already have the order. Be inside this, then the, we order them in, in from the tree. Uh, in such a way that uh, this should be consistent by the previous order, if, which was uh, already constructed before. Then the, they use the DFS to order the all the vertices between the level. Okay, and uh, yes, and what we showed is that the uh, HKM is not K plus uh, two interlacing. Actually, it is a like it is much more like observation, and uh, this shows that yeah, there are there are there is a desired construction. Yeah, but the, actually note that um, if a k is greater, the k is equal to d plus one, we cannot hope for this. But this only works when k is so it is so when when k is uh, most d. Okay, so I, I think that uh, I need to, I have a very little time for the last construction. I will just briefly remind you this, uh, yeah, yeah, for this construction, yeah. So this is a case when we have a full dimension and uh, when we consider the geometric embeddability and uh, when the, so, yeah, so this is typo, sorry. So this is typo and the when, the, the when we think about the old dimension, yes. So I'll just uh, put the definition in here, but I'll just uh, draw it he in here. So we think about three paths first, P1 and P2 and P3. P1, P2, and P3. Each of the path is uh, uh, six vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? And, and then, we somehow have uh, some hyper edges by joining P1 and P2. So we have a hyper edges in the form of something like this. For every uh, pair, pair of the i and j in, uh, from among one and two and three, we somehow think about the, all the unions that we can think, think about. So, like, um, so we select all, every ei and every ej from the e pi and pj, so, and uh, we take the union of all of this. And this is the typical construction that is called the join, and uh, we think about the join of the, those two paths, and then take a union, like this, and like this, and like, like this. So this is the construction of K1, and there is another copy Copy of K1, which is uh, which is uh, called K2. So it has a base. It has the exactly same construction, but somehow we choose some vertices like this. So it is the first and third vertices, and the and the also the fourth and sixth vertices, and we pair them. And uh, there, there is there are also the corresponding pairs in there, and we take the, all the unions in between them. So what what I mean is that we choose the any edges be 
among these pairs, and the, we choose any pairs among this pair, and the, we take the union of these two. Yeah, this this goes um, this gives a construction. Yeah. So this is the, the, the last part that I introduced is something like this: M1 join M2. And uh, this can be easily shown. So if you can understand the construction, this can be easily shown as a not too colorable because, yeah. So so let us uh, think about the, just the K one in here and. Um, Suppose that everything, every vertex uses the red and blue, blue colors. And um, if there are, so what I like to say is that uh, uh, at least one of the paths should have an alternate coloring. So that, that, is, uh, that is what I like to say. So if there is no alternate coloring, for example, like some of them should have a repeated red colors like this. And some of them has also repeated blue colors like this. And uh, if there are no alternating colored uh, path in K1, in the bottom part, then there should be at least, two, for, without loss of generality, there should be at least two consecutive red, red vertices occurring, something like this. And there should be the monochromatic simplex, which could be found from this joint. Okay, so this should not be, this should not be possible. So there should be is the the coloring should be alternate alternating here. So blue, red, red, blue, blue, and also in K one, uh, K two, sorry, there should be also alternate. Colors like this, and there is an edge, special, special edge, special pair that we defined, and there is another special pair in defined, and uh, this, this or the this, and the this and this should form the all the four, so the three simplices, and the, some of them should be monochromatic. For example, in this case, this should be monochromatic, right? Yes, so, so this, this gives the proof of that uh, it is not too colorable. Okay, so, and the uh, embedding, yeah. So this connection is not really, maybe it's time to change <laughs> my laptop. Yeah, yes. It's working again. Ah, uh, yeah. So the the zoom. So now we need to embed this one. And the, how we embed it? So we embed the K one and K2 on the moment curve again. So we, yeah. So this is the moment curve that I described, and this is the moment curve that I described, and uh, somehow uh, this could be embedded in moment curve because actually this structure can be, yeah, can be go inside exactly like this. Not only that, not only can it could be embedded, actually it is a part of the triangulation that can be formed by the projection of the one dimension higher cyclic polytope. Cyclic polytope is the polytope that could be obtained by the taking the convex hole. Okay, so yeah, it is since it is a part of the um, triangulation, it could be embedded from uh, for on this moment curve and another moment curve like this. But uh, somehow we reflect the picture like this, and then uh, we somehow make uh, this special pair, so the distance between this special pair, very, very small, in such a way that they could be almost like a, they could look like almost like a point, okay? And uh, by this, so, so this uh, situation is uh, described like this, so this is a very small and very small. They have a very small distance. And by using this, so, we, so this becomes again, looks like a very much like a graph embedding in there. So we could embed everything. So there are many details, but I will skip that. 
Okay, so okay, so and uh, this is a high dimensional construction, much more complicated, but we could uh, spot the main idea was described like that. Okay, so I'll just uh, briefly mention that actually it could be also um, somewhat generalized, extend, <coughs> ex extended into the any triangle level D manifold, triangulation of the triangle level D manifold. And uh, this uses the following extension theorem by Adi Prazito, and which, whose proof was uh, simplified by Ventrello and Yoshife. So this basically says that uh, any PL embeddable simply shell complex that can be extended into PL ball. So, that is a ba so this is what they basically say. Okay, so yeah, so, and, but the, actually this kind of question was already also mentioned and considered by Lutz and Muller, and uh, they also considered a similar problem, and uh, they, yeah, they, their construction is uh, more or less uh, based on the earlier construction by Heise and Picruco and so on. And uh, yeah, they could obtain the similar bound for the almost half dimensional cases, but uh, we, could, we could somehow uh, be, uh, manage the, all the dimensional cases. Okay, so the, here is the discussion. <laughs> okay, so now, yeah, so, so basically, uh, so for me actually, the full dimensional case is the most interesting thing for me. And uh, yeah, so for, for full dimensional cases, uh, fortunately, PL embeddable case is gone. So and full dimensional means yeah. you, your K is D plus one. Plus one. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, PL embeddable case is gone. And why we are thinking about the PL embeddable case? Actually, the, the reason that we are interested in PL embedding is that actually we want to get something about polytope. So that was our main cons main main uh, uh, main motivation. So we want to get uh, s something about the polytopes. And so I will describe the reason why. But actually, the construction about the polytopes is a very very hard. We just uh, get uh, some little bit, little construction, which has uh, only chromatic number three, but actually triangulate the simplex is much harder, might be much harder, rather than the just the geometrically embeddable thing. But the, so uh, between the triangulated simplex and polytope, there is uh, something called the Rudin's ball, con construction which is called the Rudin's ball which is not shell level. So it cannot be extended to a polytope. So there is a very weird obstruction in the high dimensional, yeah, uh, high dimensional cases like this. Yeah, so now it, this path looks uh, quite difficult, but I'd like to have uh, some more nicer construction for this path. But uh, for, yeah, from this path, somehow there is a shortcut of uh, result by Adi Prazito and Ventrello and Yashite. So we could get something about the PL sphere. So I'm currently very happy about this, but the I'm not sure. I'm not really sure about the polytope case. And why we? Why am I talking about the polytope case? So motivated from the yeah. So there is a question from the combinatorial convexity asked by Holmes and Park and Twilock about the surrounding so so-called the surrounding property. So the <coughs> Yeah, so thi yeah, this is about uh, solving that question. And uh, that question is more or less equivalent to asking about the uh, uh, transversal ratio of a fast set hypograph of a polytope. So, yeah. And, but the, again, polytope case is uh, quite difficult. So, again, Briggs and uh, uh, Michael Dobbins over there and me, we, ca we care about the this, uh, this question about the transversal ratio. And uh, not much, not many things are known ex exactly. So it, this is the all the thing that we know. Yeah, for three dimensional cases, which is uh, basically the two about the two dimensional spheres, planar case. So this is we have a, we we could somehow incur this this one, but the, we have a only lower bound which is slightly bigger than one over two. So this is not very good. But still, this is the best lower bound that we can have because for the other dimensions, actually this happens also the same in here that uh, for, actually this is an even dimension sphere case. So we cannot go over one over two. So this is a bit problematic. 
And uh, so this is uh, quite quite weird because actually the Joanne, so Mino, yes, Mino is there. So mm -hmm. Mino and Gina Kim uh, obtained a very nice lower bound for stacked D minus sphere. And uh, we, if we think that the uh, stacked, so there is uh, something called the stacked sphere, but the stacked sphere uh, is known to have a very small number of faces. And actually, the cyclic polytopes and the, uh, yeah, so this construction, so the construction in here, so, so this is uh, from the so-called neighborly spheres, and the neighborly spheres are supposed to have a very large number of facets. So the, there should be, so I think that it is much natural to guess that there should be much a larger gap, but the, in here, if, if you can see, in D equals three, it is almost uh, same as the best bound one over two. Yeah, so I think that the face numbers and the transversal ratio and chromatic number behaves uh, much differently. So I think this might be a quite interesting problem. Okay, so this is the, yeah, this is basically what we have. And actually, I, I'd like to briefly mention that the density health Jewett theorem, uh, which can be restated something like this. For a positive, in, uh, so in terms of the transversal ratio, for positive integer t and the any real r, so there is a Hell-Jewett hypergraph which has a transversal ratio bigger than r. So since we have this, again we can somehow do the yeah, so manage the PL embedding, but we cannot use this shortcut anymore because uh, this construction uses a lot of new vertices, so it will affect the transversal. So we cannot use hyper, yeah, you cannot use this path. So this is uh, still very open. And this is also very open. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so on and so on. So the much, many of the, these problems are still uh, remain to be very open. And again, so this should be a question actually. So this is not a specific statement, but this is the general question about the surrounding property. And the, this is the ultimate goal that I want to have. But the, yeah, so this is a very far away from me, I know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any questions? Michael, you have a question? <laughs> Can he like it, impose some extra condition so that these numbers are not going to be infinite? Like, because now, because of this, you cannot hope to have a like, finite number for the yeah, so for embeddable hypergraphs. Yeah, so for example, stacked polytope should have a uh, yeah, so chromatic number bounded by two. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think yeah, so we can think about the kind of the construction, yeah. So what is the transversal number of this yes. tree thing that you build? Uh, so it was, I, I remember that it was constant because I mean the every, every maximum chain, so they should have, they should have uh, all the common vertex in there. The root one. Yeah, the root one. And uh, for the other things, maybe that will increase uh, some more transversal number, but the transversal ratio remains the very, yeah. So it can be bounded by, it can be bounded by the, for example, like a, by the number of uh, children. Yeah. Are still linear in the number of vertices? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, does PL embeddable with T equivalent to the whole equivalent embeddable? No, 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 it is not. It is, yeah, it is not. Yes. What about homology spheres? That is a very good question. Yeah, but the another issue about the homology sphere or the all, all that kind of thing is that uh, I cannot. Define triangulation very nicely. I mean, 
So is there a known very nice triangulation? That might be better, and yeah, that might be good to consider. Mm -hmm. But the, the main difficulty is that um, somehow to compute the transverse ratio or the um, coloring, we need to somehow understand understand the simplicial complex structure, right? Triangulation. But the, I I don't know much about the triangulation, so. Any other question?